Test, 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 test. Test, 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 test. Well, hello everybody. Hey, it's Patricia Daker with Better Diabetes Life and thank you for joining. Getting a little festive today. Happy Halloween, everybody. Um, today we're going to be talking about freak out. I did this presentation um, last week, I guess, for a diabetes group and since I already had it, I thought I would share it online. So indulge me in a little bit of Halloween fun and we'll learn some fun coaching tips along the way. Um, if you haven't met me, my name is Patricia Daker. I've been a registered nurse for 35 years. I've had type 1 diabetes, almost 30. It'll be 30 next summer. 
Um, and I'm also a diabetes coach, and I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the presentation just to explain a little bit about what that is. Um, but it, what I've found nurse coaching to be is the things that I, were absent for me when I was diagnosed. So I hope some of this is helpful to you. So um, let's see. I hope everybody can hear me okay. It looks like my audio is working. Okay, we're going to get started. I'm doing a PowerPoint presentation. Um, there'll be some interactive bits as we go through this, but I hope you enjoy my presentation. Okay, so the name of this is How to Not Freak Out When You Feel Like Freaking Out, and obviously there's a little bit of fun Halloween theme here. So if you, you know, have lived with diabetes for any length of time, you know, let's be real, you've had some freak out moments. There are times when diabetes is super scary, and that might be related to finances, maybe insulin or lack thereof, blood sugars out of control, um, maybe complications, um, supplies, trying to deal with your doctors. There's just a lot of stuff that can put you in a panic mode. And when we're freaking out, our mind is super busy. There's so much going on and a lot of thoughts flying around and basically it's pretty unpleasant. So when we're in freak out mode, it doesn't feel good. It's not pleasant. It's anxious. And the goal is we want to get out of that mood, that place and those feelings as soon as possible. That's what we're going to talk about today. And on the lighter side, this applies to zombie apocalypses too. We want to get the heck out. When there's bad stuff happening, when it doesn't feel good and it's scary, that's the last place that we'd like to be. So if we know this stuff is going to happen, then how do we navigate our way out? Let's talk a little bit about that. So the first step is to understand who is really freaking out and what part of you is doing that? And um, I like to use a crazy cast, cast of characters. And obviously for Halloween, I'm going to use a little bit of a Halloween theme. Um, but it's sort of like the movie if you've seen the movie Inside Out. You have some of these characters rolling around in your head. And sometimes they take the stage and cause you a lot of different emotions. So first one is Frady Cat. So this is fear, and this is probably the most legitimate um, character that rolls around. He's, he shows up when there's truly something threatening you. Um, you know, you've gotten in a car accident, there's a bear chasing you, your blood sugar's low, something like that. Although sometimes Frady Cat can also tend to blow things out of proportion and tip us over into um, freak out a little bit faster. The next character that roams around in your mind is the ghost of the past. And this guy is all about regret and shame and, you know, trying to remember all those things that you did wrong so you never, so you don't do them again, right? Um, but we can also dredge up some pretty bad stuff from the past and hang on to it and carry it into our present. Our next guy is fear of failure, the what if. And this is the person, this is the part of your mind that's always thinking about the future and trying to avoid negative possibilities, which is not a bad thing. But if you get stuck in that spot, all this worry about what if, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? What's going to be tomorrow? What do I do? What do I do? When those thoughts take over your mind, again, that's not very pleasant. Okay, this one is a favorite of mine. This is Buttman, a little play on Batman. And pardon my use of a term, but he's kind of an ass. Buttman is that negative, grumpy old guy that, you know, just is negative no matter what. Everything's a problem. There's no good in the world. Um, you've been wronged. Other people are to blame. It's not your fault. Um, you know, and he just is a very negative guy that can really um, put us in a bad state of mind. And the last one is a sad, um, a sad bag of bones, right? So he is the one that um, is hollow, feels empty, low energy, doesn't have a lot going on. And he wants you to know how much he suffers. So none of these guys are necessarily bad. They're all legit and valid ways to feel. They just are there. But they have purpose on some level too. Like there's a time to be afraid. There's a time to think about what's happened in the past and what's going to happen in the future. But sometimes these guys get too loud and they take over and that's when we kind of get in this freak out mode. So the purpose of understanding who they are is so we notice them and we can notice if they're getting out of control or exaggerated. Um, and these are not all the ones you have. There's certainly a lot more feelings and emotions, but you know, for the sake of what we're talking about and because it's Halloween, these tend to work. 
So that's just a quick look of this mind part of your body, right? So if you have a lot of chaos in your mind and these guys are in here freaking out, well, what do we do? So um, it takes all of you, right? So if our mind is kind of freaking out, we have to take other parts of ourself to help us get through this and kind of get back on stable footing. We tend to typically stay in our thoughts. They're so loud and pervasive, but there's actually more to us than just what we think about. So what is all of you? What does that even mean? There we go. Okay, so all of you is yourself, right? So we have your body. That's pretty obvious. That's our bones, our body, the physical self, what we see. And that also in the diabetes world is our glucose, right? This parts of ourselves that we see, feel, touch. We have the mind. That's the part we just talked about. These thoughts, ideas, emotions, and freak out happens in the mind. This is where the problems live. And just no offense to our minds, but they can be a little bit of a crazy place. So if you think about it, you can have two thoughts at the same time that totally disagree, right? You can agree with yourself and disagree. You can like something and hate it. You can want to do something and not want to do something all at the same time. So there's a lot of instability and um, fluidity of your mind. It changes quite frequently. But there's also the spirit side, and this is part we don't talk about very often, but it's actually the smartest part of ourself. And so by spirit, I don't mean spooky Halloween kind of spirit part, but it's the essence of you. It's who you are that's perfect, that's complete, that if everybody, if we peeled back all the layers, we would see who you really were. And it's the knowing part of you. It's the part that wants to do stuff, that knows the right answer. It's where your passions live, your pursuits it's always peaceful and it's very wise. Your spirit person is never a problem and never afraid or, um, you know, not sure what to do. Unfortunately, we don't listen to our spirit side all the time because it's so quiet. We tend to get sidetracked by the busy and loud thoughts of our mind. And when we think about our mind, our mind is very reactive. Something happens and we react, right? We don't even think about it. It just happens. Where your spirit side of you is proactive, um, it's creative, it's always pushing to do something new. The mind wants to stay somewhere safe where it knows what, the, um, what all the different factors are, even if they're not good. So interestingly enough, we're, we all kind of know we're these parts of ourselves, our mind, our body, our spirit, but we really don't think about them as separate entities. And they are and they're not. So there are three different ways of thinking about us, ourself as a person, but they're all tied together. They don't live separate from each other. So if part of your body um, is affected, so is your mind and spirit. All three of these work together. So you can think about this like stage fright, right? So when your mind is worried about going on or performing, you literally get butterflies in your stomach. The nervous energy of your mind impacts the nervous system, which impacts your stomach. Um, and the other side of that is that spirit part of ourselves, that, that's the part that gives us energy when we don't think we have any left. So you think of um, maybe you're tired and you're sleepy and you're groggy and somebody calls and you won the lottery, boom, you'd be up and you'd have all this energy to go take care of it. That's tapping into that spirit side of you. So because all of these parts are connected, we can use this fact to help us when, we're, when we are in freak out mode. So let's talk a little bit about the body. So we already talked about the mind and the mind is the place where the problem is. So we're going to look at body and spirit as ways to um, help deal with some of this anxiety and fear and kind of freak out. So first, the body influences the mind, as we just discussed, right? So there's two kind of simple ways that we can interact with, that we can use our body to influence our mind and our spirit. So one is just to relax. And this is nothing more than a pause and a stop and flop. So literally, when you're kind of in freak out, if you can stop for one second, and then just relax, just stop whatever you're doing, stop wringing your hands, stop pacing, whatever the anxiety behavior or the freak out behavior is. If you can stop for a moment and then relax, like literally let your shoulders go down. Just, you know, relax your shoulders, relax your face, unclench your teeth, stop wringing your hands. You can actually calm your mind when your body stops. 
Your mind got out of control, which made your body get all anxious and do these things. So we can do the opposite. We can stop our body, which helps to slow our mind down. That's a little bit hard, but you can do it. The next one is breathe. And this is the most magical overlooked tool that we have in our tool belt. Not only from um, a usability standpoint, but a clinical standpoint. So as a nurse, this is amazing to me as this is the only vital sign that we can manually control. So when I'm talking as a nurse, um, vital signs are your blood pressure, your pulse, your heart rate, your temperature, maybe your oxygen level, even our glucose level. We could look at those are things that we can measure about the body. Um, we can't willingly change our blood pressure. Um, you know, you can't uh, just decide to make your blood pressure a certain number. You can't stop your heart. Now you can do activity that changes your heart rate, but you can't manually speed up or slow down your heart rate. Um, you know, you can't change your temperature. You could get in a hotter environment, but, but you can't just will your temperature to change. But we can change our breathing, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. If you don't think about it, breathing happens all the time. So breathing links to our nervous system. The actual physiological um, practice of breathing is connected to your nervous system. And our nervous system is divided into two parts. So one is called the sympathetic nervous system. And that's that fight, flight, or freeze. And that happens when there's danger, right? That's automatic. You can't stop it. If, if someone comes behind you and startles you, all of a sudden you, your heart rate goes up, you, you stop moving, you, you flinch. There's all these um, automatic processes that hop, happen. Your sympathetic nervous system is a survival mechanism. It's to help get you out of, out of the way if you're being you know, um, chased by a bear or someone's attacking you or you wanna be super, super still so someone doesn't see you. And that is a nervous system response that you cannot control, it just happens. The opposite of the sympathetic nervous system is the parasympathetic nervous system. And this is the part that's rest, recover, and restore. This is chillax. The easiest way to think about this is when you've had a horrible day at work and you come home and you kick your shoes off and you lay down in your chair and you let it all go. That just letting go is um, implementing your sympathetic nervous system. Now this is the sympathetic nervous system feels good. And this is actually when you're sick, this is if you can if you can get in this state, the more time you spend in this state, the faster you'll recover. Because this is why we sleep at night. This is when we digest. This is the, um, the side of our body that grows babies when we're pregnant, that repairs skin, all this stuff. So when you're not fighting off an enemy or looking for food, you want to be in this state so that you're recovering, you're calm, you're relaxing, your body likes this state. So this is how we get out of freak out. This is not freak out. Parasympathetic is not freak out. Okay, so we're gonna do a little audience participation test. So if you're um, watching at home, I want you to do this with me and I'll give you one caveat. We're gonna do two different exercises just to elicit both of these responses so you can feel them. Um, if you happen to have any heart conditions and arrhythmia, asthma, breathing difficulties, anything like that, if what I'm about to ask you to do doesn't seem safe, please don't do it. Um, I don't want anybody to get into any trouble, but if you're healthy, this should not be a problem. Okay, so we are going to get into a fright state. And I'm gonna ask you is, we're gonna pant and you're gonna tense up your body. So when I say go, I'll count and I'll guide you. But I want you to lift up your shoulders near your ears, grind your teeth, you know, make fists with your hands. And then I'm gonna count and we're gonna breathe in and out quickly for 10 times. And that panting breath is what you would do if somebody was chasing you, right? That really shallow, fast breathing. So we can do this and we'll see what it feels like. Okay, so I'm gonna to count to three. On the count of three, we're going to lift your shoulders, grind your teeth, hold your fists, and start counting, okay? One, two, three, tense. One and two and three and four and five and six and seven and eight and nine and ten. Okay, stop. Now, go ahead and relax. So if you breathed with me there, notice how you feel. Notice what your body feels like. You might feel some tingling. You might feel a little out of breath. You might have felt like a little warmth going through. You probably feel some anxiety or tension. Um, it probably felt good to stop doing that. 
So that is your sympathetic nervous system. And just as much as it happens when um, someone startles you, this breathing exercise we did can kind of illustrate that as well. Okay, so let's do the fun side, the other side of this. So this is the relaxed state, and I'm going to cue you through this in the same fashion. It's a little bit different of an exercise. So what I'm gonna do, I will guide you to take four breaths in and out. We're gonna breathe in to the count of four fully, and I want you to get big, deep breath and expand into your belly. And then we're gonna exhale for the count of eight. And if you can't go all the way to eight, that's okay, just try. Um, and we'll do this pretty slowly. So in for four, out for eight. And on every out breath, relax your shoulders, unclench your jaw, let your body go limp, and just relax, okay? This is the, the stop and flop, so we're just gonna relax on this one. So we'll do four breaths in and, and relax and exhale on the exhale, ready? Okay, so deep breath in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And in deeply, three, four, out, let it go. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think that was four. Okay, notice how you feel now. Right, just notice your body. You should feel a little bit more calmer, your heart rate down a little bit, a little bit more relaxed. So just think about the difference between both of those scenarios. Like the deep breath really is a good way to slow you down. It gets you from a sympathetic state into a parasympathetic state. And actually science shows us that when you exhale longer than you inhale, you stimulate what's called the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve runs through your abdomen and it lowers your heart rate and it kicks you into this parasympathetic state. So it's really important that you breathe in for four and out for six or eight, you know, whatever you're comfortable with. So this is using your vagus nerve. When you do this well and you're able to elicit this response, and this happens over time with practice, you get what's called good vagal tone. And that is proven to be a link to a better immune system and overall health. So you can do this anytime. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. Insurance doesn't have to clear it. Whenever you're um, really just having a panic attack, when you're a little overwhelmed, you can stop and flop, and then we can do this breathing exercise. Um, the recommendation is for two minutes. So that's 10 total breaths. We did four, but for, this, for two minutes, that would be um, 10 cycles, four in, eight out, okay? Okay, so doing this part, your spirit part was in, in charge. So again, we talked about the mind and that's very reactive. There's thoughts, there's all kinds of crazy stuff happening. The body, we just learned we can use the body with intention. Um, and when we're using that intention, that's actually your spirit, your wise part of yourself that allowed you to do that. And this is the part we don't always talk about. And remember that intention is proactive and it gives you more feelings of control and control feels safe. So when you're able to slow down your breathing and control your reaction, it feels better, right? Because it's a little bit safer. So doing this on purpose and with intent, again, is a good way to let your spirit part of yourself, the wise and, um, and calm part, be in charge. Now, this we have to pause. So that stop and plop is kind of important because this wise part of yourself you won't hear it over the screaming voices, that cast of characters that are the, the worry. You really have to kind of stop and get quiet. Um, so it just takes a sec, right? So sometimes when we're having fears about things, we're worried, what do I do? My blood sugars, what do I eat? I can't afford this, all that stuff. We're worrying about things. We need to just pause and give yourself a second. Let the smart part of you come out. So when you're listening to this stuff, you're actually listening to the truth, right? So you're listening not for the fear of what's in the future. Future hasn't happened yet. And you're not listening to what's happened in the past. You know, oh my gosh, this is going to happen again. You're listening to what is true now. And so I'm going to use an analogy of a map here. I've got this map on screen. And so when we think about a map, imagine if you had one of those old fold-out paper maps 
or God forbid if anybody remembers what a MAPSCO is. So those were maps we had way before, you know, the internet and Google, Google Maps and that sort of thing. Imagine if you tried to navigate your way out of a difficult situation, say you're lost, and you're looking at a map that's old. So that's not truth anymore because the streets aren't there, there might be new streets um, that have been developed, you're not grounded in truth. And so when you're looking at something that's old or outdated in the past, or imagine you're looking at a map of the future, right? Same thing. You wouldn't have a, um, a good way to get out. So if we're looking at the map of now, what is true right now, that's when we can take action. Right? So if we're in that traffic jam and we look at a map of right now, I can see what roads are open, where the traffic is, what the best options are, and that's the quickest way to get out of a jam. If we take that same approach with um, you know, any sort of situation, so let's say it's you know, worrying about complications. So you know, what we've done in the past, perhaps you've had some, perhaps you haven't. Right? So your past, it's nice to look at. It doesn't really change anything. Your future is unknown. You can worry a lot about, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what if? But what you can only deal with is what you have right now. So what is right now? Right now is your ability to make choices about how you control your diabetes, make choices about treatments, make choices about the doctors you're going to use, make choices about exercise, what you're willing to do. And those things are only based on today and in the truth. That's your spirit person. That's not your worry mind being in charge. So once you kind of are in the truth, you know, and we're like, okay, here's what's true right now. This is what I can really deal with. It's not my worry mind. And you make a plan that's rooted in truth. And we'll use the analogy. You make a, um, a route to get out of a jam on a map that's based on the roads that are here today. You feel pretty confident that you can do that because you know how to get from A to B. You have all that information. And that feels good, right? Okay. So our freak out fix, just to recap, we, when our mind gets a little bit out of control, we have a lot of thoughts rolling around, we use our body and our spirit. So um, the stop and plop, so stop is that intention, using your mind to slow down your body, using your mind to change your breath, using your breath to get from a sympathetic or um, panic state into a parasympathetic or rack, relax and rest state. In this place, we're paused. We've slowed down. We can listen now. We can hear what the truth is. What's real? What are the things we're worried about and what's not? And then when you're in a place of truth, we can act. That's when you want to take action. That's when you want to decide, can I do this? Do I want to do this? Will I do this? Am I willing to do this? What's the next best thing for me? Because nobody really knows better than you what's next and what really feels good. Um, the breath, as just to recap, um, the recommendation is two minutes of, of the slow breathing, 10 cycles, of four, um, a count of four bre breaths in and eight breaths out. Okay. Okay, a couple other things. So when we're doing intentional things, we are making choices. And choice gives us power. Choice feels good. So diabetes many times feels like it takes a lot of our choices away. And in many aspects, it does. There are some things we can't or shouldn't do anymore. Um, and we can choose to focus on those. That's also a choice. But when you, choose, when you choose to focus on some of the things you can do, it's empowering. And we tap into that spirit and we get more energy. So we can look at things like your attitude, right? So we, can, we know inside that we can choose to be in a snit. Or we can decide, you know what, I'm going to let that go and I'm going to put on my happy face. You get to choose that. No one can make you do that. We can choose our actions. Just like we said, we want our actions based in truth. We don't want actions reacting to panic or worry or whatever. We want to look, we want to stop and look at the truth, see what the most important thing is, and then make actions from that place. We can choose our intentions. So again, that's that wisdom, that wise part of you. Your intention is what you want and what you're willing to do. And you get to decide that. And that feels good. You can choose your beliefs, right? So in your mind, you'll have lots of ideas. You get to choose which ones you latch on to and which ones you're going to give validity to, right? And that's your choice. It feels good. Like, I'm going to do this because I believe in it. 
And when you choose to do something you believe in, you're much more likely to do it. So if you don't believe checking your blood sugar is a good thing, you're probably not going to do it. If you don't believe that some of your food choices are healthy for you or better for you, you're probably not going to do it. Um, so these things that we can choose, choosing our beliefs, are great ways to um, move forward and be empowered. You can also choose your perspective. So most of us get very comfortable with our viewpoint um, the way it is. We see things just as they are. But every once in a while, it's a great idea to kind of back up and get a bigger picture look at what's going on. That's another thing that you can do with your intention and with the spirit side of you. We can also choose our story. I could do a whole talk on this. I'll do a little bit on this right now. Our story is the message and the agreements you've made with yourself about your life. So if you look back at everything that's happened to you in your life, there's more of it that you don't remember than you do. And we tend to pick and choose over our life the things that created us or made us who we are today. Nothing wrong with that. Just know that you're not picking every possible thing. You're leaving some stuff in and you're taking some stuff out. So what we tell other people, what we tell ourselves, we get to decide which, of our, which part of our stories we tell. We also get to decide the next chapter. So even if everything in our life isn't under our control, our actions and where we want our story to go, those are things that we can control. Okay, just to recap, what the heck does all this stuff have to do with diabetes, right? So when, as a person with diabetes, we make over 200 more choices every day than the average Joe, right? And those choices can become a lot of stress. So you're constantly in your mind thinking about blood sugar activity, food, meters, medicine, on and on and on, right? There's so much stuff, um, which can tend to make us want to avoid these unpleasant things. So when we're freaking out about all these things that we have to worry about and think about, we, it's easy to get into freak out mode. So when we're in this freak out mode, remember, remember we're being reactive, not proactive. So that reactivity changes our choices. We might react to something and do something out of a knee jerk rather than looking, than, um, excuse me, stopping, looking, and making some choices. So the choices that you make, those in turn affect your actions, and every action, as we know, everything we do can really affect our glucose, everything. So when your mind's kind of out of control and it's just causing you to scurry around, we want to use these other aspects of self to get back into a place where it feels better. Okay, so all of this being said, it's impossible to do this perfectly every time. Nobody's going to always stay in parasympathetic state, nor can anybody always stay in the, the sympathetic state, right? It's a balance. We go back and forth. But I think most of the time we don't realize we have some of these choices and we tend to stay in this worry zone too much. But when you're intentional and you stop a little bit and you think about things, it opens up some new possibilities. And that's really what we want to do. We want to think about if I'm always doing everything the same and it's, I'm not getting good results, let's think about some new choices. What could I do differently to help me get to where I want to be so I'm more um, calm and I like life better? But that's, again, this isn't scripted. There's no way to constantly control this. This is just a tool that you can add in your tool belt that you can use when you can, right? Some days are better than others and you may need it or you may not. Some days, you know, if... If you do come upon a bear in the woods, this stuff goes out the window. Um, but that's just the way they are, right? But when you can, and if it's possible, let the wiser, calmer side of yourself take the wheel. You'll end up in a much better place. So that's kind of the the, um, the wrap for how to you know, not freak out when you're freaking out. We're going to use our body and our spirit side when our mind's a little bit out of whack. Okay, so that kind of concludes the presentation. I did want to tell you a little bit about nurse coaching. Um, so what we did today was called a holistic exercise. Most of my training as a nurse and all my education um, through the diabetes realm has always been focused on the body. And over the, my course of life with diabetes, I had a lot of frustration. It was harder than anybody said, no one understood. And I really just didn't feel like I was getting the whole picture. Nurse coaching has really helped me to understand I wasn't and what's missing, um, which is why I pursued this certification. So it's a subspecialty of nursing um, real quickly. So all nurse coaches are registered nurses and we have to have a bachelor's degree and um, several years of practice um, 
under our belt before you can become a nurse coach. So like I said, I've been a, co a nurse for 35 years. You have additional 60 hours of training and coaching. And that's not clinical information. It's how to affect changes, change management, helping clients to achieve their goals. How do you get somebody to tap into their own intuition and do things that make sense for their life? So coaching is much more about having a, helping a person to determine if this is the things that you need to do in your life to take care of yourself. What does that look like and how can you do it in your life? And how are the little steps that you get there? It's never big jumps. So we have that training. Then we have 60 hours of supervised training. We're actually um, with a preceptor doing that with clients. Um, and it also focuses on chronic disease management. So, um, you know, just looking at the lifestyle change, what you get from your doctor is the prescriptions, the care, the what to do. Nurse coaching is how are we going to make that work in your life? And as we saw here, it's holistic. It's not just about the body. It's not just about getting your blood sugars right. Um, once you get kind of your spirit tapped in and you find things you're willing to do, you, you do it your way because it makes sense to you and you understand what's at stake and the choices you have, you're much, much more um, able to live in a way that feels good to you. So in a nutshell, again, if the doctors are the what to do, and a therapist might be, why is this happening? They're looking back at your childhood and trying to figure out, you know, all the reasons why. Coaches are like, how do we move forward? If this is where we're at and we get, we need to do some things, how do we do that? How do we get full, move forward? So that's what I do. Um, again, I can help with education about the disease process. I can help you certainly with understanding diet and things like that. But where I really come in is with the struggle. If you're stuck and you don't know what to do and this, it seems overwhelming or you've tried this a million different ways and it's still not working or you feel like someone doesn't understand or they're trying to get you to do things that you can't do. That's where coaching really comes in. So as a little sneak of it today, but not the whole thing. Okay, so that is it. That's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Um, I do have a chat box open if anybody has. I added a count in the Excel. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'm just now looking at your uh, your note. Um, if we do have questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. We can do that. Give you a couple minutes. So it is kind of funky doing some of this stuff, right? It's not stuff we're used to hearing about, but it's amazing how how it works. I guess I'll, I'll tell you that the proof is in the pudding. Um, there's so much anxiety about trying to do clinical stuff perfectly and it's impossible. So um, really tapping into these other sides of yourself and it's really coming back into um, vogue, if you will, in the medical community. We're seeing much more holistic care where we realize, you know, you need the comfort of family. We need to tap into some of these other sides of ourselves so that we're balanced and we're, we're able to use our bodies in the way they were meant to be and that we can um, optimize healing. Okay, last one. Here's my website if you're not familiar with it. Um, my email is there if you have questions. So it's patricia at betterdiabeteslife.com. Um, my business number is there as well. So you can contact me obviously on Facebook anytime, um, email that you'd want, my website, lots of ways to get in um, touch. So if this resonated with you, I would love to hear, um, you know, what your thoughts were, because I know it's different and it's, it's unique. It's not what your typical diabetes um, plans look like. Okay, so that, thanks for all who joined and thanks for the comments. Let's see, we'll go back one more time. I'll get on here with my witchy, witchy face here. So happy Halloween, everybody. Um, I hope you don't have any freak out moments tonight and I hope you have a lot of fun and be safe. Um, there are websites out there with the carb count and candies. I've already seen some of that. So, you know, if you're going to indulge, do so wisely and make sure you make some good choices. But thanks again for joining me and, um, visit me online, drop me a note and happy Halloween. Thank you.